This is Duke University. Oftentimes when sees in uh, analyses of uh, Turkey's uh, policies towards minorities, or there's an assumption sometimes stated explicitly, other times implicitly, that there's some sort of peculiar defect in uh, Turkish uh, political culture that makes uh, for very problematic relations um, with minorities. By the way, should I keep the mic on or turn it off? Or? I think this is, this is as good as it is right now. And they actually need the microphone because they're reco we, the oh, session okay. is recorded. Okay, all right. Um, in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll let it uh, stay on. Um, <clears throat> so there's this assumption oftentimes that there's something very peculiar, uh, something purely wrong, some kind of defect in, in Turkish uh, culture. Um, and I want to push back a bit at, uh, on that, or at least what I want to show is that there are uh, uh, clearly identifiable historical reasons that explain uh, the sort of troubled uh, relationships uh, with minorities. The Turkish Republic, as I see it, is nothing if it is not uh, a response to the problem of uh, Ottoman uh, decline. That is, its institutions were uh, self-consciously designed to present the problem of Ottoman dis disintegration and uh, decline. And in order to understand those institutions in the Turkish Republic, therefore, one needs to understand this, this process of, uh, of Ottoman decline. Now, I, I realize for this is a very bold, maybe even radical statement for an historian to make that, well, to understand, understand some given entity, you need to understand what uh, preceded it in, in the history. Uh, but I think it really is quite important in the Turkish case um, because it is uh, really quite self-consciously done, number one. But number two, the uh, long-standing, if I could use the word, Kamala's understanding of history uh, differs very significantly, I think, from uh, outsiders' understanding of Turkey's uh, own history and in, in, in the, in the process of the breakup and decline of the Ottoman Empire. And it also differs very much from both of those interpretations of history differ from uh, that of the uh, current uh, basically ruling government in Turkey that's been there with the AKP now for uh, how many years is now? About 13, correct? Close to 13, 12 to 13 um, years. And so I'll, at the end, maybe I'll touch very briefly if I have, I have a chance on um, that, uh, how, how the, the current government today has a very, also very different uh, interpretation of uh, history. So the, um, what I think it's important to note is that the uh, decline and partition breakup, uh, dissolution of the Ottoman Empire coincided with a major change in, uh, in the norms of, uh, of global politics. Um, what do I mean by changing uh, norms? And basically I mean the rise of the national uh, idea. And by the national idea, I think Eli Kaduri, uh, to paraphrase him, gave a very a good uh, de definition of it, a very useful one, where essentially the national idea is that humanity is uh, naturally divided up into discrete entities known as nations. You can uh, define nations by clearly identical characteristics uh, that, that set one nation apart from others. And that each nation, therefore, it deserves its own, uh, its own state, deserves uh, political uh, sovereignty. Now, today we know that this, um, this is a very much more problematic uh, idea. For example, how do you defining nations is not nearly so easy uh, as people had assumed. But I do want to make the point, uh, or I think it's important to underscore how embedded this idea of the national idea is in our views of uh, politics. It's, it's in our very language. We speak of the United Nations. And really, what it's not United Nations, rather, the United Nations is not a group of nations, a gathering of nations, it's a gathering of states. Um, even the field of, of political science and political scientists, uh, unlike historians, are uh, some historians pay a lot of attention to definitions, but generally, political scientists are very good at defining terms. And yet, one of their major subfields is that of international relations, where the assumption is that nations are the uh, basic units of global politics, when of course they aren't. They are s states. That's what political scientists who work in international relations aren't working on nationalism. They're working on uh, relations uh, between states. So this, you know, this idea really is very strongly embedded in, in our language. Um, one of the results of I know there are, uh, the American uh, invasion of Afghanistan, of course, is that many Americans naturally enough assume well in Afghanistan they must speak Afghani. And then after getting in there, many Americans are now aware that, well, no, Afghanistan is not simply a nation of the speakers of, uh, of the Afghani nation or uh, speakers of, uh, of Afghan, but is a mix of, of various uh, ethnic groups. Um, so the world is much more complex, as, as we now realize, uh, than the, nation, the idea of the nation, national idea would, would, would imply. But it's such a powerful idea that, it, again, it's embedded in our language, even in our, our uh, acad academic language. Um, so this idea becomes uh, much more powerful in the 19th century. 
Uh, <clears throat> now this is, but it, I think it's important to note that um, it's not so much, certainly in the Ottoman case, at least the way I see it, it's not so much a grassroots phenomenon. That is, this isn't something that boil, bubbles up from below where there's a rise of uh, national consciousness. What's more important to understanding what really drives the, I, I think, and I argue um, <clears throat> in my published work is that the, it's the way that the national idea frames the uh, diplomacy of the great powers. This is a world in the 19th century that's overwhelmingly dominated by uh, the great powers of uh, Western Europe, and they are the ones who set the rules uh, for uh, the conduct of, of global uh, politics. And when I say global politics, it also means in the case of the Ottoman Empire, oftentimes uh, local politics, because the, the influence of the great powers is, is such that they affect things at the local level. And when you, one looks at the way that they describe politics, the way they pursue politics, they really begin to see the world increasingly through the 19th century as one that is uh, influenced by the national idea. And this is where you see the, uh, the European reference, usually the, to the Ottomans, it's not as the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire, but it's Turkey. They see the Balkans as divided up into uh, discrete uh, nations. Um, and that's, uh, again, the, the, these are the key uh, units, as they see. And the Ottomans, as their, uh, as their empire, uh, is uh, falling behind, has fallen behind the uh, decline in its relative uh, power to the to the uh, European states. It goes through this partition uh, process of partition and dissolution. It's often done in the uh, name of uh, of nationalism. You have in particular the, the Balkans. A number of, uh, of uh, ostensible nation states are formed. But when you want again, when one looks more closely, for example, the Greek Revolt, one discovers well, is it really nationalism that's driving things, or is it more rather um, uh, local uh, responses to Ottoman attempts at centralization and to uh, the, the Istanbul's attempts to, you could say, maybe rene renegotiate the structure uh, of the empire as it's uh, trying to reform itself and to rejuvenate uh, its power in pursuing policies of centralization, which uh, then uh, provokes responses from local levels, and then those are uh, put in the uh, framework of, uh, of nationalism because this is what uh, legitimizes politics. And so the rise of, the, of the, this national idea uh, um, delegitimizes the Ottoman Empire by the, the, the middle of the 19th century. So the Ottoman Empire almost by definition is an entity in the eyes of the Europeans should not exist because it is nothing but the domination of Turks over non-Turks. And that is something that um, uh, cannot ultimately uh, be tolerated. Now, a good example of this, I think, where one sees the, just to pick one example uh, of, of the influence of national ideas, is the, the Treaty of Berlin. So this is after the War of 1877-78 between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the Russians have uh, imposed upon the Ottomans one treaty. The British, the French, the Germans aren't too uh, keen on how much uh, things the Russians are taking for themselves and insist that this treat, peace treaty be renegotiated by all the great powers Interestingly, they don't include the Ottomans, even they're discussing and the question is whether, whether the Ottomans owe the Russians after this war. The Ottomans are excluded from the conversation and they uh, renegotiate this treaty and it becomes known as the Treaty of Berlin. One of the key uh, phrases, or one of the clauses in this treaty uh, obliges, excuse me, does not oblige, gives the prerogative to the great powers to uh, intervene on the behalf of uh, Armenians if the Ottoman Empire uh, does not provide for the uh, protection of Armenian lives and property in uh, eastern, uh, in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, that is uh, the um, <clears throat> eastern Anatolia. Uh, now this uh, caused a great deal of uh, concern among uh, another group living uh, alongside the Armenians, the Kurds. And I want to uh, show Back here, when we think of um, you know the Ottoman Empire, I think like probably when before I started studying Turkish history, I think I assumed, I, and I think like most Americans, most outsiders assume that sort of the Ottoman Empire is basically a Turkish Empire. So probably begin somewhere here. They probably unified Anatolia, then they went and conquered the Arab lands, the, the, the Middle East, and then after that they began their push towards into the Balkans and towards Vienna. So the uh, assumptions that it begins here and it's more Middle Eastern, and then it only gets into Europe. When you look, this is, this is not showing the growth of the Ottoman Empire. It begins here, the very early stages, and you'll see here really quite early on in the empire, you see what? It's about half is located inside of the Balkans. So these territories here are not added colonial territories of the empire, but this is very much the heartland uh, of the empire. So when they start losing these uh, territories in the, come back to the other 
map. So this is a map showing the, the, the breakup of the empire from 1878 onwards. So as they're losing these territories, it's not as if this is a um, <clears throat> colonial empire, that these are territories in which, well, really, the, you know, the Turks really had no business being there, there were foreigners there. No, this is, they're losing their heartland. Uh, and this sends a signal, uh, particularly to another group that living out here, so you have Armenians and, and uh, the other predominant, or the, the, the predominant group out here are uh, Kurds. When they see this territory going, they know, oh, well, if this, this is uh, the heartland of the empire has been lost, who is to say that out here is not going to be lost as well? And so when they see the great powers discussing the importance of protecting a particular ethnic group, the Armenians, it makes uh, the Kurds very nervous because they see this is precisely the same process that occurred in uh, the Balkans. And we might very well suffer the same fate that peoples of the Balkans, the Muslims of the Balkans uh, suffered. Uh, they were good Ottoman subjects, but then uh, this territory was taken from the Ottomans and then the uh, Muslims uh, were uh, expelled. So, um, <clears throat> The, the Treaty of Berlin, again, makes a, a, a great many of uh, uh, um, uh, Kurds uh, quite uh, nervous. Uh, another uh, an interesting thing to note also in this uh, discussion um, of the Treaty of Berlin, one of the things that the, uh, the Russians took from, uh, the, uh, from the Ottomans is the uh, port of uh, Batumi on the Black Sea. Now, the British were not so happy about this. Why? Because they thought, okay, this is going to strengthen uh, the Russian uh, presence on the Black Sea. Of course, the British are always thinking about the importance of, of naval power. And they were trying to think, well, what are some ways that we could come up to argue that the, the Russians should not be able to take this territory? It had not been conquered militarily by the Russians. The Russians insisted that the Ottomans give these provinces over as a war in indemnity. And the British were trying to think of ways we could argue that they shouldn't get it. And they discovered that, well, when people... There's a certain people living around here called the Lobs. Uh, they speak uh, Negrelian uh, language, and they are a, a distinct ethnic group. And then the British actually began trying to thought about making the argument, well, you know, the Russian Empire should get this territory because it belongs to the Lobs. So here, here you can see the, the impact of the national idea. Not that the British thought, well, their hearts were bleeding for the sake of the Lobs, but they're saying we can deploy the idea of the Lobs nationalism as a, uh, a geopolitical ploy keep the Russians from getting hold of uh, Batumi. They realized, of course, this is one that wasn't going to carry much weight in the discussions, they, so they dropped it. But it, it's, it's quite um, uh, revealing. Now, in um, 1908, you have, uh, of course, the, the, the so-called Young Turk Revolution, the restoration of uh, the Constitution in the Ottoman Empire. And um, the, when the, the uh, CUP, that is a Committee of Union in, in, in Progress, uh, sometimes known as Young Turks, I prefer to call them Unionists because that's what they call themselves. And again, it's very much the, uh, the term Young Turks is favored by uh, European observers who are always putting ethnic labels on, on, on groups. Um, so the Unionists, uh, what's important to note is they realized they had a real mess on their hands in, in Eastern Anatolia, uh, where, where there's a sort of long... I shouldn't say long-standing, simmering, this uh, conflict between Kurds and Armenians that was beginning to uh, increase at the end of the 19th century as Armenians were able to improve uh, their economic uh, positions. And, and the, the Kurds saw this as both a threat to themselves economically, uh, but also were beginning to perceive a real uh, political threat by because they see the increased great power interest in um, uh, Armenians. So this... Uh, tensions between Kurds and Armenians were growing. And then the young Turk, the Sunnians come to power, their initial policies are really quite favorable to the Armenians because they, what they seek to do is um, they understand we need to enforce a centralized rule. That's one of their main, major goals in coming to power uh, to make the empire that much more effective at extracting resources. So you want to have the same laws applied with this, uh, throughout the empire, and that includes in eastern Anatolia. And that meant cracking down on uh, Kurdish tribal chiefs who essentially were able to run affairs as they wanted under the, the, the previous Sultan Abdul, Abdul Hamid II permitted that. And they understood, so that, that was, they needed to do it for their own goals. They also understood that we need to keep the great powers from intervening possibly in this territory. We do need to create uh, better order and uh, protect uh, the Armenian uh, subjects there. This, however, had the effect of alienating a lot of the Kurdish tribal chiefs who did what? They started collaborating uh, with uh, the Russian Empire. 
Um, many of them began discussing uh, the possibility of joining the Russian Empire because they had the idea of the, you know, the Russian Empire, a classical, had, still structures a classical empire. That is, you had places like Bukhara, which they pointed to in particular, that were uh, autonomous regions under uh, the Russian Empire that permitted, uh, basically, in that case, the Central Asians, Bukharans, to uh, live much as, as they wanted to. Uh, they were part of the empire, but there wasn't this in, uh, interference from the center. That was precisely what Istanbul uh, was beginning to insist upon after uh, 1908. The Russians were interested in collaborating with the, uh, with the Kurds uh, for two reasons. One, the Russian Empire was very much paranoid about the problem of Armenian uh, revolutionaries. Uh, I, mean, I could say a, a lot about that, but I'll, I'll just, for the sake of our, this brief discussion, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so they, uh, there's a, the fear of, of Armenian revolutionaries and the recognition that the, really the dominant element in this region are the Kurds, and to the extent the Russians are worried about maintaining order on their border in the Caucasus, um, they realize they, uh, they, they realize decide we need to have carry uh, influence um, with uh, the Kurds. Now on the eve of, um, let's see, do I have a map of? Um, on the eve of uh, World War I, of course, you have the Balkan Wars. So you have these territories are, are lost, 1912, 1913, um, are, are <clears throat> lost to the Ottoman Empire. Prior to that, the connection Italy is also takes the uh, uh, triple into the NATO, contemporary Libya. The Balkan Wars are a major shock to everybody, including the Ottomans. Uh, and these wars, again, are uncomfortable. When they lose these territories, it's not as if, okay, we lost some colonies. But again, these are the, the heartlands of uh, the empire. And the loss of those territories, as probably many of you know, are accompanied by mass ethnic expulsions. So the idea is when you lose Ottoman sovereignty, it's not just that things change on the map. It means people lose, uh, they lose their lives, uh, they lose their homes, and they're driven out. Something like 400,000 uh, Muslims are driven out after these wars in 1912, 1913. They show up in Istanbul. Uh, Eastern, uh, excuse me, Western uh, Aegean coast. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, let me uh, also point out that the, uh, the, the leadership of the uh, Ottoman Empire, the, the Unionists, are overwhelmingly from uh, this region right here. Something like 44% came from the Balkans, another 21% uh, from Istanbul. And then uh, from the area of Marmara and the Aegean, uh, there's another, um, another roughly 20%, so about 86% of this group uh, called the Committee of the Union Progress comes uh, from this area. And they are the ones who uh, are, are in the rule of power, essentially, uh, they, they are the ones who established the, the Turkish Republic, arguably one could say, in the sense that they remain the dominant element in Turkish politics up until about 2012. It's important to note that they come from this area, so they are uh, the collapse of the empire um, is a personal trauma for them, not just a, uh, let's say maybe say a professional trauma, as one might say it was for, for the British as they saw the loss of their empire, um, or even, um, well, they were perhaps uh, the, the French. Um, on the eve of uh, World War I, uh, so as yeah, so a response to this, um, the, the, the right the, loss of the, the Balkan War shocked the Ottomans. It also shocked the Russians. The Russians were shocked because you, it was one thing for the Ottomans to be defeated by by the Russians themselves, or if they were to have been fought a war with the British or the French, you'd have been defeated. But to see that small uh, states like Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia uh, can defeat the Ottomans, this meant that maybe one day or in, in the not distant future that Bulgaria could perhaps seize the Straits, uh, or Greece could make a bid uh, to, to to grab the Straits, which was very worrying to Russia. So the, it looks like this very fragile empire. Uh, Russia is very concerned to make sure uh, the straits remain open because the Russian em uh, empire is so dependent upon these for its exports, roughly 50% of uh, Russian exports go through the straits. And again, they're worried about the security of their, um, uh, their border here with the Caucasus. Their control of the Caucasus is, is, is not 100%. Uh, percent. And they're worried about not just not so much the Ottomans, they're worried about other outside groups, the British, the Germans, or the French, being able to, in some conflict, being able to use this as a second front against Russia, much as it happened during the Crimean War. So in order to shape what they see as the incoming dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, they insist upon an, uh, 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 a reform program for Armenians. In 1913, um, the negotiations begin. Now, the, Ottoman, the Russians have basically ignored the Ar Armenian question from 1878 onward. In fact, when there were massacres of Armenians, 
in the 1890s um, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. There's some talk about the British perhaps intervening on the behalf of the Armenians, and, and the Russians quashed it. They said, don't even think about it because what you're really trying to do, you're, going to, you're intervening not for the sake of Armenians, but for the sake of uh, Britain's geopolitical interests, and that's going to harm ours. So they quashed any possibility of intervention. So suddenly when they start talking about this in 1913 and insisting to the Ottomans that um, you're going to have to carry out reforms here, you're going to have to appoint uh, Europeans to oversee the administration of these provinces and basically strip uh, uh, Istanbul of control of this area um, <clears throat> because you're not able to provide uh, security for the Armenians there. The Ottomans, they, they have to negotiate with the Russians, but what they see is a really dirty game going on here because the Russians are, at the same time that they're pounding the table and saying, you aren't doing enough to protect the Armenians, and we're going to have to intervene. And if you don't do what we want, uh, we're going to actually intervene uh, militarily. The Ottomans know, and not just the Ottomans, if you read sources, the British and Germans, everyone else knows what's going on at the same time. The Russians are actually backing the Kurdish revolts. And the Kurds, or their primary concern is what the, the possibility of being dominated by uh, Armenians. So at the same time, they're saying, you aren't providing for this protection of your Armenian subjects. Under the table, they're the ones actually sponsoring the, uh, are the ones putting Armenian law to jeopardy. So when the Ottomans look at this whole question of uh, the national idea, this, this is something that's used instrumentally against us to justify the, the dissolution of uh, our uh, empire. And you know, therefore, when they go into World War I, one of the very first things they do, they declare war, they declare this Armenian reform program that they signed on in 1914, um, they and, and, and declare it void. So it's, we're not going through with it. And that reform program was very similar to the same process as the way he lost so many provinces in Macedonia. That is, they were, were stripped initially from the Ottomans, but given over uh, to Europeans to oversee. Uh, to, to run the police to administer the provinces, and then uh, finally the Ottomans uh, were, were lost their control completely. So when they signed this in 1914, and everyone believes this is simply the next step for this part of the empire uh, going uh, to the Russians. Um, excuse me, that's uh, not that's that one. Um, this just to show is uh, what happens during World War One. Uh, this is how the great powers imagine that they're going to divide up Anatolia. Um, and as you look at this map, this is basically a map that Sykes Pico Sazan uh, agreement. Um, you'll see that later after World War I, there, this is what the picture looks like of how the Allies think they're going to divide. Very similar map, except you see what? Instead of the Russian Empire, the Tsar has fallen. So Russia's engaged in civil war. You have the Bolsheviks that come to power. So they're not going to be the, signing treaties with the British and the French. They're now enemies of the British and the French. So these, this territory here, is assigned to a greater Armenia, um, and this territory now is not going to go to Russia, but it's going to be demilitarized, and you see this territory going uh, to Greece. Um, and you'll also notice, you'll see here, that there is this new entity, Kurdistan, which the idea is it's for five years, I think it was for five years, it would be under nominal control of this part of this Turkic uh, state uh, here. This is going to be a rump. Uh, what was going to be left of the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan would rule this sort of rump Turkic state. And this Kurdish state would be nominally, I think, again, for five years to come and tie to it, but then would have the right to independence. And eventually, the idea is it's going to become independent. This is precisely the nightmare of the Unionists uh, that they were trying to prevent. That is, the final, they saw this empire slipping out of our control. The European powers are, are grabbing it. Our last, uh, what we want to do is at least maintain uh, control of Anatolia. And now you can see what's going uh, to happen to it. That doesn't happen thanks to Mustafa Kemal was able to rally uh, the Muslims of Anatolia and they uh, established what becomes known as the Republic of Turkey. Now, um, of course, what happens in uh, 19, uh, 1915, where Armenians are uh, deported en masse uh, from this territory, is massacred, basically, you have the Armenian uh, presence in eastern Anatolia is wiped out. You know, they've been there for thousands of years. It's one of the major changes in the uh, demographics of, of, of the Middle East. Um, so they are extirpated the Syrian Christians as well. Then you have the process during the, the after World War I, with the, the Turks called the War of National Salvation or Liberation, where uh, the Greeks are expelled and you have this population exchange. So effectively you have, in terms of religious minorities, you have very few uh, are relatively speaking Armenian Christians, Greek Christians, and then uh, some Jews are left. They're given, they are given special rights 
under uh, the Treaty of, of Lausanne. The Treaty of Sever, this previous, this is um, um, basically Mustafa Kemal and his forces are able to uh, defeat this vision of, of dividing uh, Anatolia in favor of establishing this Turkish nation state. Now, they declare, they basically, the problem of the Ottoman Empire was this fact that the outside powers were only, always able to latch onto um, the various ethnic differences in, uh, in the case, again, it, uh, provoke conflict between those ethnic groups and the central state, and then intervene on their path. And that's precisely what they saw the problem with the Armenians was. It wasn't so much the Armenians themselves were a problem, but they saw uh, the outside powers, and they actually wrote a report on this, um, and analyzed it quite straightforward. Everybody said the, the, the British, the French, and the Russians certainly, but even the Germans and the Austrians were always willing in, in, to use the Armenian question against us. And so the decisions, as long as we had Armenians living among us here, because he had this, uh, this complex, which we'll talk to in more detail, about was the difficulties, of, uh, particularly with not just the Kurds, I don't want to put that sort of all blame on the Kurds, this isn't blame the Kurds, but there was the fundamental structural uh, conflict between uh, Armenians and Kurds that the, so there's always going to be reasons to justify some sort of intervention. So the decision is taken that, well, the, the solution to get rid of them, not so much because we hate Armenians per se, but rather they can always be used as a wedge against us. Now, to prevent that from happening in the future, the idea is taken, this is the Republic of Turkey, and uh, the, the, the non-Muslims now, they're such a small group, you need to worry about them too much, but the Muslims of Turkey, they are all declared essentially they are all Turks. And um, <clears throat> this is the idea is over uh, assimilate them to Turkish culture, create a homogenous nation state that no one from outside can then uh, uh, divide and then use that to, uh, to justify any kind of territorial um, uh, partition of uh, the Turkish Republic. And that's sort of all of the institutions, the Turkish uh, state, schools, the military, et cetera, very much have pushed this message. Now, the process of building of a Turkish na nation state has been remarkably successful. You, know, you have all these um, uh, groups, Komaks uh, um, uh, from Bulgaria, Circassians, Albanians, uh, sort of the, the, the flotsam of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, Carmines, uh, Tatars, etc. The vast majority of them now all identify as Turks, but there's been one major problem uh, from the perspective of the uh, <clears throat> project of Turkish nationalism. You have one group, the Kurds, who are about probably 12% uh, or so of the Turk population, maybe up to 15%. So the one, they're a significant group, um, and they're also compactly settled uh, in the Southeast, which makes it even more difficult uh, to assimilate them. The, so they, the Turkish Republic has never succeeded in uh, assimilating, to, you know, convincing the Kurds that, in fact, you are ethnic Turks. In fact, by pushing the idea of Turkish nationalism, it caused many Tur Kurds to push back against that and realize, well, wait a second, I'm, uh, I don't speak this language that's taught in my schools, I speak a different one at home, who am I? Well, in fact, I'm a Kurd. So it's had the effect of um, uh, generating a uh, Kurdish nationalism, which very much didn't exist uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. By the 1990s, this was recognized, uh, I think, implicitly by all Turks. It wasn't people weren't able to openly discuss it, uh, but by the beginning of 2000s, now it's all re well recognized that in fact Turkey does have a problem with the Kurds. There is a problem with Kurdish nationals, and this is where the Kurd government, uh, to its credit, I mean, to deserve perhaps criticism a lot of other uh, topics, but they have been very forthright in, in, in coming forth and stating that we have a. Um, uh, 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 Kurdish population here, and uh, this is summarized the way I see uh, the policy of um, now that the, he's now the current prime minister, but the foreign minister Ahmet Davutoglu. The one reason why they're so critical of, of Turkish nationalism um, and, and being Islamist and identifying, looking back to the Ottoman past, we tried to draw upon that. Um, they, so there has been a push by uh, Davutoglu, well, Erdogan, the current government, to essentially depoliticize ethnic identity. So if the, um, and this is behind the idea of pushing visa-free regimes and going to, uh, to for, uh, free travel between Turkey and its, its neighbors about depoliticizing uh, ethnic identity in, in, inside of Turkey, admitting we have many people who are not Turks, and that's okay. That at least the idea, if you were a Kurd sitting in Diyarbakir, and you can speak Kurdish at home, you can go out in the streets and speak Kurdish, you can go, let's say, um, um, you know, to Mosul in Iraq, you could go to Aleppo. This is before, of course, things have completely fallen apart. 
then you can go to Istanbul to do business, which is probably you know the, the Kurdish capital of the world now is Istanbul in terms of population, the largest number of Kurds that there than any other city. If you can go to all these places, do you really need your own state? Uh, and this is by, and, and there are, it's a vision that's very similar to that of the European Union, but it's one that draws on uh, this idea of, you know, the Ottoman Empire was also this sort of, uh, from ethnic terms, a cosmopolitan entity. And um, so decolonize uh, ethnic identity, and you, you get rid of this uh, inherent tension that you have, as long as you keep pushing Turkish nationals inside of Turkey, you're going to alienate your Kurdish population and drive them away. So where the response of the Kemalists, and then the way to stop the partition of the Ottoman Empire is to adopt nationalism and to build a Turkish nation. Uh, Davutoglu and uh, his supporters in, in, in the AKP, their recognition is adoption of the idea of assimilation of the national idea is not going to stop the partition of the Ottoman Empire. In fact, it's ultimately going to lead to the partition of Anatolia and the Turkish Republic. That's sort of, this is an acid or a poison um, that by ingesting it, you know, that came from uh, the West, and by ingesting it, we're only doing ourselves, and we have to get rid of this idea, uh, and because otherwise it's going to lead to the uh, breakup of our um, uh, state. But I guess maybe just you know, to conclude, though, I wanted to, um, uh, well, let me just briefly, so this, uh, there's still very much the paranoia and sort of the Sever syndrome among uh, Turks, as they're all taught, there's this idea, again, that this is what the Great powers wanted to use to divide up our country. Um, that's still very much live, and it doesn't help. This is a map that was drawn by a retired army colonel, Ralph Peters. Uh, it was published in, uh, don't let me know, remember the Journal of um, Armed Forces Journal, I think. Um, it wasn't an official statement of the US military to try to convince Turks that, okay, American military officer publishes a map in an American military journal. Don't, don't, this is just some die dueling in, in his uh, spare time, well, they're not going to buy that. This is like, this is the Pentagon's vision of the Middle East. So this is his idea of how, we, several years back, of how the Middle East map should be drawn. And you'll notice here a big free Kurdistan with big chunks of Turkey that are now uh, part of it. So when the, again, the Turks see the, you know, the Europeans, the Americans start talking about you know, the rights of Kurds, the rights of minorities, what they see are not really people interested in, in the human rights, uh, of those citizens, but rather they say, okay, this is an idea of how do we divide up the Middle East and make it easier uh, to rule. And I guess I want to emphasize this is, um, certainly this is exploited by various groups in Turkey, but it's not entirely, I mean, there's good historical basis uh, for this paranoia and fears, and one can see how those fears continue to go on today uh, when you have maps uh, like this, which again, this is an official military policy, but it sure begins to look like that when you look at it from a, a, a Turkish Perspective. Um, so I, I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll conclude with uh, that. Thank you. Um, we open for discussion. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate your, your uh, presentation and a lot of details I didn't know and some I did. One of the things that I was kind of missing was uh, a little bit more discussion of uh, what I would call the Armenian Kurdish dilemma, tension, mm -hmm. outcome. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that I'm asking it from a very particular viewpoint because Yekta and Turkumas, and I think you must know, oh, sure, yeah. written on this question. And his idea is that the real issue is it's not just Armenians versus Kurds, but the Armenian leadership didn't know which way to go. No, I mean, this is why, um, uh, you know, looking at the Armenian, the Armenian dilemma is absolutely impossible. Um, they uh, absolutely, the, um, you know, the, 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 for example, on just to uh, this question, the Armenian reform program. It was a very divisive one. This is what you get in 1913. The Russians say we need to have Europeans coming in here, preferably Russians. Uh, the Ottomans with the German support were able to, in fact, I think it was a Norwegian and uh, was it a Dane who were going to be uh, appointed. They're able to water down the Russian proposal a bit. Um, but the, this would seem a great thing for the Armenians because it's going to bring order to this region so you wouldn't have these constant um, uh, clashes going on. Uh, between uh, Armenians and, and, and Kurds, but the Armenians, the Dashnaks, the Chun, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, sort of the main group representing uh, Armenians at the time, was very heavily divided on this. And the reason why is because the, it's been summarized that the Armenian dilemma is the Russian state was too strong. Because they knew the Russian state wanted to quash the Dashnaks, the Chun. And in fact, when we look from the period, when we look at the period 1908 to 1914, one finds a lot of cooperation between. Uh, the Ottomans and the CUP in particular with the Dashnaks against the Russian Empire. 
they were arming them. They were uh, using, uh, carrying out attacks on Russian soldiers inside of Iran with Ottoman support. They were uh, using, staying at Ottoman uh, consulates, uh, building bombs to use against the Russians. So, I mean, one of the trips the, 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 Turks, the Turks used, particularly in the 1980s, is talking about Armenian terrorism. And you know, I say, well, this is a great example of Armenian terrorism, but who's behind it? It's not the Russians, or it's not Armenians, it's actually um, uh, the CUP. You had uh, Armenian uh, uh, books, writing books, including in English, pointing out in, uh, in 1911 that the, uh, the, the Russian empire is our real enemy, not the Ottomans. Uh, you know, now the, the Ottomans have a constitution, and uh, the Russian empire is. So they, saw that, you know, they also saw this Armenian reform program as going to be a very mixed blessing for them, that in Perhaps it would provide more security for Armenians living out there, but it would mean it's going to lead to the uh, annexation of the region by the Russian Empire, and the Russian state will crush us. Uh, the problem, uh, so the dilemma for the Armenians is the Russian state was too strong, and the Ottoman state was too weak. Because the Ottoman state is trying to, uh, you know, in, in CUP in 1908, they, from out 1908 to 1910, they really try to crack down on uh, British brigands, if you want to call them that in Eastern Anatolia to protect uh, the Armenians. But then they, after, well, there's still cooperation that goes up to, to 1914, but then they realize they have got a real problem on their hands because Kurds, there's a lot of them, and they have weapons, and they can cause, and they did cause a lot of uh, troubles for, for uh, the CUP with the rebellions. And so you're trying to, you're fighting wars in Italy, then you have the Balkan Wars, and then you're faced with this low-level insurgency uh, that's going on in the uh, East well, you want to keep some of those curves on your sides, and they realize, uh, therefore, you have to back off from uh, pushing too hard on behalf of uh, the Armenians. So the yeah, Ar Armenians are kind of stuck in this. Yeah. The one part of your thing, yeah. sorry, that you, you, you kind of glided over here, which I think is really crucial, is that there are also Kurds who, who are Ottoman loyalists. Mm. And I, no, think, yeah. I think that's because when people say, oh, yeah, yeah. it's the Turks killing the Armenians, that's, again, the reductive nationalist notion that, oh, if they're, uh, but a lot of those Turkish were actually of Kurdish origin. You no, know, absolutely, and that's one of the, is the difficulties of describing talking about this thing. You know, I, it would be like talking about the politics in this region at this time. It would be like saying, okay, discuss World War One with the uh, category of European, <laughs> and say, okay, the European. What do you mean the Europeans are fighting the Europeans? are fighting the European. The, 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 the Kurds are divided. Our, our Armenians are divided. Um, uh, then you got the Russians divided. But uh, but what can point to you does see a, there is a fundamental. Uh, Sort of tension between Armenians, who are largely sedentary population, and the Kurds, who are, are nomads. Yeah, nomads. And and you know, and the way that the Kurds, the way the future is going, uh, is that they, as nomads, uh, their standard of living was, was god awful. The rates of infant mortality, the rates of disease, blindness were extraordinary uh, among uh, the Kurds. And they said, we we aren't literate. We have no schools. We have no infrastructure. And we can see these Armenians. We read World War One. Almost all Armenian males were, were literate. They are forming nascent uh, merchant classes. They are being able to, uh, they're getting wealthier. Not that they were, this is one of the myths that Jamil mentioned, they were wealthy Armenians. These are peasants in the vast majority of living under land that's owned by Kurdish tribal chiefs. Yeah. The Kurdish rank and file, we're, we're very poor. We're worse off than the Armenians. And things are beginning to look like changing for the Armenians in terms of economic prospects. You know, and, but also it looks like perhaps political prospects. Because the assumptions are Europeans, they're Christians, they, um, uh, the Armenians are able to go to send their kids to missionary schools and so on and so forth. And this creates a real panic among uh, the Kurds. And they go off in different directions. Some of them you know, very closely collaborate with the Russians. So the Russians are going to be the ones that are going to bring to us schools, uh, education, and are going to be able to save us. Um, others are, are looking uh, to the Ottomans to come in and get you know, the pan Islam, et cetera. It's a, it's a complex picture. Um, but it's one, you know, from, from the Ottoman state, all this becomes irrelevant because what comes important to them is that, that the great powers are going to intervene and use the Armenians against right. us. And therefore, like it or not, we've got, we, they make the decision we have to get rid of them. Um, okay. Yes, so, I mean, you compared, I mean, that's, 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 that's very interesting the way, um, an explanation of the way in which the Turkish nationalism and Turkish nation states. Um, is as a uh, reasonable fear uh, that uh, the Turks and the Kurds uh, are being encouraged by uh, international, by powers, uh, uh, outside powers, outside of Turkey, um, to um, rebel and 
the sales conversion. Um, and uh, so that may be contributing um, to um, the um, hostility which we see in Turkish uh, nationalization policies uh, towards the Kurds and the Armenians, and may even account in part uh, for the Armenian genocide. Um, I was wondering whether you can now can talk about it from the other perspective, which is of interest to us, which is the perspective of nationalization. Um, and in a way, young Turks are in power. There are new policies about nationalizing Turkey, right? They apply not only to the Kurds and to the Armenians, they apply to the Jews, they apply to other minorities. Uh, there's legislation concerning language and so on. Um, could you talk a little bit about the way in which as a nation state and as policies of nationalizations in Turkey, as part of the process of modernizations, secularizations, and nationalizations, uh, minority policy changes under the uh, under that in Turkey. Yeah, the, the, again, I think the first I would I would uh, I wouldn't describe the policies necessary as ones of nationalization. Uh, and this I would, I'm on the same page I think with Hassan Kaila, who has written you know, Arabs in, in uh, Young Turks um, and uh, others, but in particular his book, uh, which made this point uh, quite strongly. Um, the CUP was not so much, I, I, I see as really a group about Turkish nationalism per se, but one very much about holding the empire together. It's the, the question of, of union. And as part of it, essential to that is uh, centralizing. Uh, and this is where okay, if you're going to centralize uh, your government and uh, your state and make it more efficient, that means what? You have to, uh, the, the, process, the policies become ones that are very uh, similar, the same ones you largely that you would uh, carry out if you were engaged in a project of nationalization. So they begin uh, insisting on, uh, for example, uh, that Turkish be used as an official language for official state business. Not so much because they think Turkish is a better language, than the other languages, or because they themselves are insisting that we're Turks, and therefore, because um, many of them weren't Turks, uh, the Committee of Union Progress, most of the founders of, of the group were, were not ethnic Turks, and, and the one, there was, you know, the one, I think was a, the seven who was, was actually from Azerbaijan, so he's from outside, even uh, the Ottoman Empire. Um, they, um, <clears throat> There, the, 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 um, the question of uh, 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 centralization is, 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 is critical. And that's what really begins, uh, my, Michael Hector uh, has written, a, I think, an excellent book on uh, nationalism, where he goes, you know, what really uh, provokes nationalism is um, the, whole, the substitution of direct rule for indirect rule. And it's when the center starts insisting in the periphery that you have to do things the way that we want them to be done the, the way that we in the center that this sh should be done causes peripheries to start saying, wait a second, we don't, want, we don't agree with that, we want to break away. And this is, in fact, what uh, explains the, the, uh, uh, the process of the growth of nationalism. It's, it's more of a question of uh, centralization uh, being, excuse me, direct rule being substituted for indirect rule. And I think that works very much in, in the Ottoman case. So as the Ottomans, as the, the CUP, um, it wants to uh, tighten Istanbul's control over the whole of the empire, that causes uh, local notables, et cetera, to start to want to break um, so from the empire. We, yeah. we are now in Buddha and the and Turkey as a nation state. Uh, oh, How do we tell the story then? Oh, okay. Well, they, then, I mean, then, that's much more there. It definitely is a conscious story of uh, Turkish uh, Turkification. Um, and, you know, that's maybe I could, can I get this on uh, this way? Uh, yeah, let me just put that maybe in the. Um, you know that all of the, you know, in schools, etc. Everybody is taught here that you know there, there's one language, Turkish. Um, everyone is taught that they're a Turk if they're a Muslim. Uh, that's the only identity uh, that, that's recognized. And the idea is that all Muslims that live within these borders are uh, Turks. And you cannot recognize uh, the existence of um, uh, of, of non-ethnic uh, of Muslims. Non-Turkish Muslims, because the uh, you know you don't have too many uh, Greeks, Armenians, and Jews left over, but they and also Assyrian Christians, you know, they are given specially recognized as being uh, special groups. But there's such a small number that that's from the perspective of the state we can tolerate it. Although it's also interesting to keep in mind it doesn't you know, prevent their sort of a popular uh, widespread kind of feeling in Turkey that looks upon these groups as having very uh, doubtful loyalties. 
um, uh, to the state. So um, you know, it's not a very comfortable thing to be in the Turkish Republic if you are um, uh, an Armenian, uh, Greek, uh, Orthodox, or, or a Jew, or an Ar Syriani. Um, but the uh, you know, in terms of the, the big question, of, uh, the political question in Turkey is that of the Kurds. Um, because they, you know, they think we, we aren't Turks and we aren't going to become Turks. So you're stuck with us. So what are we going to do if we're saying we're part of a country that's Turkey and you only recognize uh, Turkish as the only official language, the only official uh, identity? We're not very happy with that. I mean, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, I think that's from, from the perspective of the workshop. I mean, that's, the, that's where we, I would like to understand something about the name that is big. What, what happened to the imperial heritage? Right, the so, the right. The so the this is the imperial heritage, and what's very interesting, that, you know, when the, the, the Mustafa Kemal in, 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 in comes to power, they re totally reject the imperial heritage. They, the Ottoman period is a period of disaster, uh, di disaster uh, for the Turkish. You know, they, they teach basically look, Islam, excuse me, the Ottomans were, led us, the Turkish people, into disaster because uh, we were religious, and that led us into economic and uh, technological stagnation. And then we were spilling you know, good Turkish blood on behalf of uh, people in the Balkans, on behalf of you know, Arabs in Yemen and elsewhere. And what did that get us Turks? And so forget the empire. It was a, a nightmare. We're glad to be done with it. We're the Turkish Republic. We look you know, to the future. And um, uh, there's nothing good really to be taken from the Ottoman past. The AKP, so the, you know, the, the party that comes to power in 2002, has a completely different view. They say, we had this good thing going in the Zayada Empire. They well, totally romanticize it. They flip everything on its head. So they see that the Ottoman Empire was a time when we all got along. Or so maybe I should point out, they understand that there's this basic problem with the Kurds. And uh, they're able to sympathize with the Kurds because uh, they, as being uh, pious believing Muslims, also experienced um, uh, repression from the Turkish state. So they, understand, they don't see the Turkish state as being something that is um, uh, completely um, uh, all good. If one can make a legitimate criticism of the Turkish state, that's not difficult for them to accept. So when they see Kurds criticizing, you know, we can understand that. Then further, they say, okay, the policies that the Turkish state carried out against Kurds, uh, various forms of repression, the, uh, uh, the way they fought the war against the PKK in the 1990s, you know, their, uh, Erdogan, in fact, it was oversaw a report that was very critical of that. And they see, look, the Kurds were fellow Muslims as well. And there was a time, they said, when we all got along, all Muslims got along under the Ottoman Empire, in fact, then they further romanticize with the Millet system and say, not just Muslims, but in fact, non-Muslims recognize how great this was. Uh, and they, they point to uh, the, you know, the, the fact that you will the Millet system when after the conquest of uh, Istanbul, you have led you to go to the uh, museum of the conquest of Istanbul, and they have uh, documentation about how uh, you know, Mehmet, the, the conqueror, uh, then invites Christians to come back in, and then there are letters from the Christians to uh, Mehmet saying we're so thankful that we can come back here. And so the image is very much one um, of a liberal, you know, almost liberal in a cosmopolitan order where everybody got along until this idea of nationalism was introduced uh, from the West. And that they have been very much playing on this, uh, so part of this, uh, this rekindling of interest in the Ottoman period is very much, I see it, driven by this, like, how do we resolve this big question that we have with our Kurdish population? Well, we had another model that was an imperial one that worked. So let's try to bring that back. And this is one of the things that explains this uh, alliance that was between the AKP and many Turkish liberals. So it's, again, it's very similar to the European Union's idea of what's uh, uh, downplay national identities and ethnic identities, but it's using the Ottoman past as the, um, um, uh, the uh, framework, the, the frame, the um, uh, making reference to, to explain in terms that are understandable to Turks, to make some, uh, something that is it is part of our own history, to reclaim that and uh, use it again uh, today. Um, uh, it, it seems that we have these uh, two uh, entities, one empire and the nation state. Mm -hmm. and the story of this uh, one of the transition from one to the other, and then there's this mess in between. Um, but um, I see, I mean, the, the aspirations of certain Kurds to sort of uh, see their fate with Russia reminds me of these other state projects. I see Trans Transcaucasia there. Right. Um, and uh, actually you have. I 
this map, or actually, this is just 1918 when you first had the Armenian Republic, the Georgian Republic, and the Yeah, so Republic. they, yeah, that's, um, um, there's one sort of state project there. And then we, we have, for example, oh. M Mver Pasha in Fergana Valley, uh, Valley fighting for some sort of tyrannic kind of idea. And then we have similar state, similar projects, failed projects, if you like, um, in this period, later also in the, in the interwar era, and even in the World War II. So, and these state projects bring together groups that don't necessarily fit in the framework of empire, but not nation state either. So it's, how do you, how do you explain, the, how do you sort of conceptualize these kind of failed projects of world from, starting from the, uh, the, the mess of the world, the wake of World War I, all the way to uh, post-World War II era? Um. Well, I get. I mean, the I mean, the question is, what makes a project successful and what makes a failed one? And I think that's the extent to which. Uh, well, two things. One, um, you need recognition by other states, is so they'll recognize your border. None of the other state need to be recognized by other states, and that's critical. And um, maybe more critical, the other, the first factor that came to mind is having an army or something that you can control the uh, territory and essentially say that you have monopoly of the. the um, uh, means of organized violence in a given territory. So you need those two things, maybe the more important one is, is that you have recognition from outside states. And I think that's um, the, the key thing that distinguishes a failed project, if you want to, between an imperial project and a nation state. Because when we start looking at a lot of these places that we think of the nation states, I mean, again, the Turkish one, right? It's not homogenous. You have a large, you know, Kurdish and other, many other uh, groups inside of Turkey, Iran. Um, uh, as well as is not a homogenous Iranian state. It's got you know 25 percent uh, at least are of Azerbaijani Turks, um, etc. You have the Union of uh, Soviet Socialist Republics. Is it an empire? Is it a nation? Certainly not a nation state in the sense that it has a tremendous amount of uh, ethnic uh, diversity. Um, but all these things are successful projects because they're uh, recognized as the borders are recognized by the other states, and their legitimacy is recognized, and they are able to control those borders. Is that? I don't know if that answers partly. But, uh, what I'm asking is with the Transcaucasian. So the Transcaucasian this was later then uh, divided up into uh, the republics of Georgia, uh, Armenia, and uh, Azerbaijan. This is initially how the Bolsheviks uh, established it. But the interesting thing about the Soviet Union is that, and it's been described in Yuri Slosky, um, and the Bolsheviks had uh, were uh, ethnophile. That is one of the key things in understanding the development of ethnic identity in the Soviet Union is they insisted that every single group has to have an ethnic identity because they were good Marxists and believed that having an, uh, going through this stage of nationalism is required of all groups throughout history. So uh, in order to become modern, before you can become really properly socialist and, and ultimately communist, you have to go through a, a process of having a national identity. So every single Soviet citizen had to have this stamped in their passport as an official, they had to have an ethnic identity. And that's what they end up doing. Um, you know, here they establish a Georgian Republic, an Armenian Republic, uh, an Azerbaijani. Um, they can't, you know, this we get, uh, I don't have the map here, but you know, we have uh, uh, Chechnya, et cetera, the North Caucasus is divided up. And then Dagestan, where you have over 30 something ethnic groups, they keep that as an administrative unit. But each of those ethnic groups is recognized as official ethnic groups. And you write that into your passport. You have, um, uh, each ethnic group in the Soviet Union is, the, uh, is given an official, because uh, all those nations, right, should have an uh, official traditional garb. They have to have a national poet. They have to have a, a national, uh, they have an official dialect, you know, a, a, um, a language that's um, a formal, formalized. So all they had scholars working on for each of these, you know, over 100 something various Soviet ethnic groups. They had a checklist of all of these things so that everyone had a uh, ethnic identity. Um, so it's a very different uh, national project that goes on in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. One where the state is insisting everyone have an ethnic identity, but the real, from the state's perspective, of course, the key identity is the fact you're all Soviet and you're all under the Communist uh, Party. And the idea is we, we have to move people through this ethnic uh, identity to get um, to a properly uh, socialist one. Um, so these aren't uh, so much, a, this isn't a failed project, it's, it's a temporary one, 
um, that after a couple of years after formation, so they then, they then divided up into Georgia. But they issued money, right? They, they have banknotes with Armenian, yeah, Georgian, and yes, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I believe you're right. But this, this is part of the process, the formation of the Soviet Union, and this is all controlled by um, the, you know, the the Bolsheviks. Um, it doesn't reflect any coming bubble you know, on the, at the grassroots. Um, Speak to the role of religion in sort of the ethnic identity and nationalism. Oh, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that, that's 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 the uh, in in what in what context? Well, I mean, you talked about Armenia, and then you mentioned that they were Christian, and that the, mm -hmm. you know that the fear was that that the you know that the West was going to intervene on their behalf right. because they were Christian. Right. But I'm not, you know, since the you know we're really talking about religious minorities here. You know, my, my my question is oh, okay. is it, and of course as we see in the you know with Erdogan the sort of I don't know if I want to say Islamification but certainly it's becoming you know the sort of tension between the sort of attitude more secular nation mm -hmm. state as opposed to the Islamic Republic. Um, I get the the Armenian question. I guess that's the the. the, the, the there is an Armenian Apostolic Church, which is its own separate entity. It's not Orthodox. It's not part of Latin Christianity. Um, so it's its own uh, entity, which, to which the vast majority of our Armenians belong. And you find others, that, um, some Armenian Catholics, uh, some Armenian Protestants. Um, on the question of the, the, from the, in the Ottoman case, the, the evolution of Greek Orthodox uh, identity is more interesting. That's where many people from the Balkans, all Orthodox Christians, were regarded by the Ottomans as being part of the Rum or, or Greek Millet. Because again, this is religiously based. As throughout the 19th century, though, that begins to fracture. Um, so you have the formation, I forget what year, I don't know when the Bulgarian um, uh, millet is established. Yeah. So the Ottoman state recognizes, because this is a growing problem of dealing with these, uh, uh, the Christians uh, in the Ottoman Empire. So they actually endorse this as a way to kind of divide them. They recognize now there's the Bulgarian millet, because there's a tension between the Bulgarians. Why should we, you know, we don't speak Greek, we go to the same church, but we're different people. Um, so there is a uh, you know, Bulgarian millet, but um, when you have the formation of these, I keep going to my computer, I mean this, um, you know, these uh, entities here, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, in 1878, the vast majority, majority of Bulgarians ask, who are you? It's a Greek, meaning you know, Greek Orthodox. Um, and it's only later that the, the, the national identity begin, they begin to uh, adopt that. Um, on the question of uh, you know, secularism in you know, contemporary Turkey now in, in uh, minorities, I think another sort of, I mentioned to you one of the positive stories, I think still a positive story among the, with the AKP government has been the opening to the Kurds. Another one I think has been, um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, they've been, I think, much more open to religious minorities uh, in, in, inside of Turkey because, again, they see the story... Non-Muslim religious minorities. Excuse me? Non-Muslim. Non-Muslim, non yeah. Non-Muslims, um, <clears throat> do they? Because um, <clears throat> they see their, uh, they, they see themselves very much self-consciously. I mean, they say, speak out as open. We are reviving the Ottoman legacy, and a part of that legacy was the Millet system, and that, in their view, good Ottoman Muslims you know, should tolerate, should have um, uh, religious minorities, and that was part of the Ottoman Empire. It should be part of our current day reality inside of Turkey. So they've. You know, permitted um, uh, you know, masses to be said at um, Akhtamar, uh, Armenian church uh, out in Van, um, in the tribe zone, uh, former Greek Armenian, uh, is a Greek rather Greek Orthodox uh, monasteries. Um, recently, they uh, were permitting the um, uh, Suriani church. I can't now remember what was it. This is really uh, quite recent, but they've been much more. Not as much maybe these groups are hoping for, but it's been a market change from the Kamalists, which were very skeptical, even though the secularists were still very much, uh, were not neutral. I mean, this is one of the problems discussing Turkish secularism. Um, it's very different from the American idea, where the idea is you know, the state doesn't interfere with the church, the church doesn't interfere with the state. You know, it's a religion and politics. Rather, it's you know, the state controls as the ultimate authority um, over uh, religion. And uh, so the Kamalists were very much always very skeptical and uh, suspicious of the uh, non Muslim minorities. Essentially, these are untrustworthy uh, elements of our uh, society. 
And the, despite the, well, it might, it might seem odd, but the, uh, again, the, the, the AKP, they see part of being good Muslims with this Ottoman legacy is that you recognize and permit your non-Muslims, uh, your Christians and your Jews to, to identify and carry, you know, to, to worship as, as, as they see fit. You didn't say much about the Jewish part. Um, yeah, because I, I, you know, the, the um, that, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to say, because I, I have, I, I wouldn't, I don't claim any uh, particular expertise over that. That gets in very, also gets in the uh, question of the church's relations with Israel, yeah. uh, which is a whole another situation. Then, you know, the, 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 yeah, that's, um, I mean, I could speak about Turkey's relations with Israel, but, um, I'm not talking about Turkey's <coughs> Just uh, I think we're running out of time, but I want to uh, briefly comment on the dilemma of secularism is that actually Armenians uh, who were left in Istanbul, uh, according to Lerna Ekmek Cholu's dissertation that I, that, that I was familiar with, during the British occupation of Istanbul, they could openly talk about who did the Ukrainian genocide, who was a national. Well, once uh, the Turkish government was established as a secular state, of course, they couldn't openly talk about it. But there's also a debate among them, Sadhu, that that if the secular nation state is better for Armenians rather than the caliphate of the Ottoman Empire. And, and it seems some Armenians thought maybe we moved in a new era, whatever, whoever is left, um, they could they could do better. And you know, kind of 19, mid 1920s Armenian press uh, talking about it. Recently, of course, there, there's a case of, uh, I think, Nora's former boss, uh, an Armenian, it, uh, it's at that time, and became the advisor to the Prime Minister. It's kind of a rare event. Yeah, he's, he, there's two Armen, uh, Armenian Turkish intellectuals who have played sort of an ideologue type role um, uh, advising the, um, the, the president. And um, they, uh, one of them recently, I think it's coming out as a book, wrote a, a book called the, the Closing of the Hundred Year Parentheses. Um, and it's uh, kind of... Um, uh, an intellectual articulation of this sense among uh, some Turkish Armenians today that the present government is, um, because it uh, emanates from a political tradition that is in opposition to um, the CUP, uh, sort of ethno-nationalist tradition, um, will be uh, more amenable than, a, you know, a better chance that these guys will recognize uh, the genocide than uh, anyone else in the Turkish sort of political firmament. Um, but, uh, yeah, of course, it's um, uh, the trend in that direction vis-a-vis, -vis, I think, um, uh, the, this is this is my personal opinion. It's someone who's working on a bit more contemporary issues and invocations of uh, the Ottoman past um, is uh, among Christian non-Muslim minorities. Therefore, there is um, this sense of uh, uh, a conversation that can be had that you couldn't be couldn't be had before. Um, but then I think very much in terms of the Ju the Jewish community, uh, which was kind of a, a Potemkin minority, a protected minority uh, under the sort of Kemalist secularist um, framework um, perhaps feels much more vulnerable now than they did uh, under the Kemalist. Well, one thing maybe we can discuss in the final discussion that really um, has to be uh, covered is, is that of course Jews were the last uh, upholders of the Middle system because they didn't have... Yes, and, and not only in Turkey. Yeah. They are the imperial people. Yeah, but then yeah. Uh, what is fascinating is that of course this Middle system became a victim of um, geopolitics and you know, minority rights are not working. So there were, according to Mark Mozauer's great chapter on uh, Jewish international lawyers looking at the Ottoman example, the Turkish example, arguing that we can't uphold the minority rights regime, you know, the whole Middle system minority rights. So therefore, actually what Turkey did eventually with population transfer is actually the best way to go because we can't, I mean, it's, it's not either or, it was uh, Raphael Lankin was not in our opinion. <laughs> minority rights vision, but uh, Mark was always, uh, I use in my class, one of the best chapters on this, is that is how um, Kemalism and the Turkish nationalism without minorities, uh, without the Middle system, becoming a model um, to uh, Israel, and then uh, also maybe to Pakistan, maybe. Somebody has to study that too, whether Pakistanis also look back on, on, on the Ottoman example, or the Turkish example. Um, so it's precisely actually that phenomenon of a secularist government that appears to be secularist nationalism that appears to be much more intolerant 
minority rights than the government that precedes it or that comes right now, the religious ones that, that brought up the question for us here uh, today about the uh, relevance of the Millet system and the imperial legacy uh, for, contemporary, for contemporary Turkey, but, also, but even more so for contemporary Europe. Um, so how about if we take a very short break, coffee break right now, and then we shall uh, uh, proceed to the uh, next lecture.